Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off tonight. An outbreak in the dugout. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm scared. More players test positive, games cancelled just four days in. Is COVID stealing the season? As infections rise on the prairies, a stark warning from a COVID survivor. It can change your life drastically. He spent 24 days on a ventilator. Now he's telling his story. Taking the hot seat, the Prime Minister will be grilled about the we controversy this week. The school year is just weeks away, but will it be safe? Not comfortable at all. We are not close enough to quite understanding um, the virus itself. Kids and COVID, how easily do they spread it? How severe the illness can be? What you need to know. This is The National. The return of pro sports has been a huge boost for millions of Canadians riding out the COVID-19 pandemic. Though even without fans in attendance, the virus is still a major factor. The basketball and hockey seasons officially resumed this week after a run of exhibition games. But Major League Baseball, which just returned four days ago, could be in big trouble already. With a serious COVID-19 outbreak among the Miami Marlins resulting in lost games, and calls for the league to rethink its strategy. Ellen Morrow has reaction from inside the game and out. The Marlins have been the topic of conversation. Even as the Marlins beat the Phillies last night, several Miami players already had the virus. At least 13 team members have now tested positive. Every day we're taking risks. If you're traveling, you're in planes, you're in buses, you're in different hotels. Uh, it's the risk that, that we take. One that's triggering fears of a strikeout for Major League Baseball just days into this season like no other. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm scared. I, mean, I really am. I hope that, you know, MLB sees that, you know, that these guys are putting themselves at risk for the love of the game. My biggest fear is that we're going to see a player who will end up on a ventilator. Unlike the NHL and NBA, which both have adopted a bubble strategy, baseball players are traveling around the U.S., still struggling to control the pandemic. Not only do they assume a lot of the risk of community transmission, but on top of that, they um, are putting a lot of onus on players and individual teams to self-monitor. Those concerns are part of the reason Ottawa wouldn't let the Blue Jays play at home like the team wanted. The moment we left Canada, there was concern. You know, we got to follow the guidelines. It's not going to be easy. Former Jays star David Price sitting out the season tweeted players' health wasn't being put first by the league. I can see that hasn't changed, he wrote. This is going to be a critical 24 hours for MLB leadership. And if they are truthful in saying that health and safety is at the forefront of this, then we will see um, them have to make a hard decision. But so far, no major changeup from league executives, just the two postponed games. The Jays tonight faced off against the defending World Series champions. We have not seen him have a mask on during the game. More players masked up and hand sanitizer at the ready. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Now, there may be some serious doubts about Major League Baseball's wisdom, but NHL players now settled into their two bubble cities are still feeling confident, including Toronto Maple Leaf Mitch Marner. The Marlins and the MLB are doing their own thing. I'm not really paying attention to it too much. I know they're still doing a lot of traveling back and forth and all this stuff. I think for us, we're looking more at the NBA, who's been in the bubble for however long. Um, we're doing the right things here to stay safe and stay away from each other. All 24 NHL teams are now in Toronto and Edmonton under those strict COVID-19 protocols. Interaction between players and fans is absolutely banned. Exhibition games start tomorrow and the season officially resumes on Saturday. Now, COVID-19 caseloads in Canada are still short of crisis levels and the country is battling to keep them that way. And not just in Ontario and Quebec. Clusters in the West have continued to emerge and grow. In the first half of the month, Manitoba reported no new cases. Now it's tracking up to a dozen a day. Saskatchewan's daily cases have followed a similar but higher trajectory. And Alberta has seen new cases go from around 30 to about 100 a day. Alberta's chief medical health officer stressed today those numbers are concerning and the most important response has to come from Albertans themselves. Carolyn Dunn shows us for some the danger is very real. 
Just days after a South American crew, 64-year-old Peter Ruptash began having trouble breathing. He landed in a Calgary hospital for 39 days, 24 of them on a ventilator. Once very active, Reptash says he's talking about his experience so people will take measures to avoid it. Week, I lost 30 pounds of muscle while in the hospital. But I think the what we call long haul effects that I'm having is I have extreme fatigue. I, I find myself napping for two to four hours every afternoon, joint pain. Despite accounts like that, Alberta's cases have been rising for weeks. But because the number of hospitalizations and ICU cases have gone down slightly, non-essential businesses won't be shut down again, at least not yet. And what we are doing is working on a more um, assertive approach to reminding businesses of the need to follow that guidance, uh, encouraging businesses to look again at the lists of things that they can do to keep their staff and patrons safe. The province has chosen to not mandate masks in public indoor spaces. The temporary mandatory mask bylaw. Leaving many municipalities scrambling to deal with it. Banff passed its mask bylaw today. Okotoks Mayor Bill Robertson has tonight convened his town council three weeks early to debate the highly divisive issue. There are those people that don't want um, anything done like this because it's an infringement of their rights. There are others that say, no, we're starting to spike. We need more stringent provisions in, such as mandatory masks in indoor spaces. Ruptash is urging Albertans to not underestimate the virus that nearly killed him. It can change your life drastically. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. In the prairies, several Hutterite communities have been rocked by COVID-19. In Saskatchewan alone, more than half of its active cases now come from those communities. But as Karen Paul shows us, along with the virus, Hutterites also face the spread of suspicion and stigma. They work, eat and worship together, leading simple and secluded lives, easily identifiable because of their distinctive dress. We also are hearing um, unfortunate stories about them being turned away from services, from stores. Marianne Kirkby left her Manitoba Hutterite colony shortly after writing a memoir, but she sees the discrimination her family and friends are facing because of COVID-19. This is a huge time for Hutterites because the farmers markets are open and their produce has always flown off the shelves at the farmers markets. Now people are staying away from them. Last week, a Hutterite minister threatened to file a human rights complaint if the province continued to link their communities to COVID-19. The province agreed to stop unless there's a risk to public health. Now we see stigma against the Hutterites uh, and it actually hinders public health's ability to, um, uh, to control this virus. The Hutterian Safety Council agrees and wants Saskatchewan to follow suit. When the, the government started identifying um, the COVID cases by culture, it started to, to push our people away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. But Saskatchewan thank has thank continued the practice. In the coming days, public health officials will visit every Hutterite community in the province to inspect compliance with the public health orders. David Cheddar worries people with symptoms will go underground and that won't help anyone. We've identified why we are running into uh, some challenges in, in, in some cases, and, and this is why it's just the fear of being stigmatized. Medical health officials say no one should be stigmatized for getting tested, but Cheddar worries that's exactly what the Saskatchewan government is inciting. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. There is also a new community outbreak reported in British Columbia. It's at this blueberry packing plant in Abbotsford. An investigation began last week. 15 employees have tested positive for the virus so far. That plant is currently operating at a reduced capacity. Now, infections are often traced to super spreader events. And after police responded to a large house party over the weekend, the Ontario Premier was not very happy. A whole bunch of 200 yahoos show up to hold the public. Like, guys, what? Like, man, come on. Like, what don't you get? You have everyone in the province sitting there bending over backwards, and we've got a bunch of jokers out there that, that think it's no problem 
go out there and hold, hold, the, hold the party. An estimated 200 people attended the party in Brampton, Ontario, complete with valet parking and security. The owner of the home now facing very large fines. Another house party in the area ended in violence. This part of Ontario has relatively high infection numbers and that has held it back as the rest of the province entered stage three reopening. The south of the border, the numbers are still staggering. California has now surpassed Florida in the total caseload with more than 450,000 infections. Both states have more cases than New York, the epicenter just a few months ago. Notice the number of new cases in the last seven days, though. That is where you see the real difference in direction. Overall, more than 4.2 million Americans have caught the virus. And as Katie Simpson tells us, one of them is the latest case in the White House. Robert O'Brien, the man responsible for keeping America safe, has been hit by the so-called invisible enemy. The National Security Advisor is the highest ranking member of the president's inner circle to test positive for COVID. I wish him well. I hope he's OK. Apparently it's a light case. O'Brien's diagnosis comes after Donald Trump's personal valet tested positive this spring, as did the vice president's press secretary. Donald Trump Jr.'s girlfriend also got COVID. The president today did not appear worried about the new exposure. Wearing a mask, he toured a pharmaceutical lab predicting a vaccine will be ready in the near future. But by the end of the year, we think we're in very good shape to be doing that. By the end of this year, we're going to be, in terms of the vaccine, I think in terms of therapeutics, even sooner than that. There's been no cases in our restaurant. No. Any word of a scientific breakthrough is exactly what Steve Forbes wants to hear. He's laid off 60 workers at his restaurant, and sales are at about 8% of what they normally would be. We don't have a viable business until there's a vaccine. I think that America has done this one foot in, one foot out on this quarantine. It was a failed quarantine. Forbes is bracing for things to get worse, in part because of new quarantine rules Washington is now imposing. Anyone coming into D.C. from one of 27 states deemed a hotspot must isolate for 14 days, meaning the little tourism that is still taking place will likely end. Think of Ottawa. For those folks in Ottawa, think of what the capital is like, the capital like in every city. We're downtown D.C., three blocks from the White House, and... Tourism is a tremendous amount of what we do. Across the U.S., normally busy streets like this one could be radically transformed by the time a vaccine is available, Forbes says, because he's not sure how much longer independent businesses can hold on. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Some companies are beginning human trials in the U.S. for a COVID-19 vaccine. We're not looking for a winner we're looking for a number of winners. The largest of them for Moderna. 30,000 volunteers will be given two doses each, some getting the vaccine, others obviously getting a placebo. CBC News has created an interactive site so you can see the progress of all the potential vaccines. Just search for CBC News Coronavirus Vaccine Tracker. Europe is seeing a surge of COVID-19 cases, especially France and Germany. Now the UK is imposing quarantine orders on vacationers returning from Spain. And as Rene Filipponi tells us, that move may jeopardize the European tourist season. Returning home from beach vacations in Spain, the abrupt reality of 14 days in quarantine was unwelcome for some. The rules are changing all the time, which is very difficult for people like ourselves. Spain is experiencing a spike in COVID-19, with large outbreaks specifically in the north. The UK government says it isn't taking chances and put in place a blanket quarantine for the whole of Spain, including popular tourist locations with lower infection rates than Britain. The Spanish Prime Minister called it unfair, saying a quarantine for the entire country is an error. We all recognise that public health comes first, we know that in the past the virus has arrived in this country through foreign travel. Nearly two million Brits had vacations planned to Spain in the next month. The trips were booked once tourism started to reopen in Europe in June. It's kind of a, well, if this can happen to Spain, could it possibly happen to Italy and Croatia and any of the other countries? And the answer is it probably could. Spain isn't alone. There are surges of the virus across Europe. Political leaders in Belgium and France are warning their countries could be headed for a second full lockdown if things don't turn around. 
Germany has seen its highest daily increase since June. The government is considering making voluntary airport testing mandatory for anyone returning from high-risk locations. The WHO says global travel needs to open back up, but safely. It is going to be almost impossible for, for individual countries to keep their borders shut for the foreseeable future. Economies uh, have to open up, people have to work, uh, trade has to resume. The possibility of a tourism season this summer is becoming uncertain as concerns grow the high infection rate in places like Spain could travel to other popular destinations. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. This week, the Prime Minister will appear before the House of Commons Finance Committee over his government's decision to partner with WE organization for a summer grant program. The Trudeau family and WE have close ties. Evan Dyer with the significance of this appearance. The date has been set for Thursday. Both Prime Minister Trudeau and his Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, will testify. It's rare for a Prime Minister to appear before a parliamentary committee. The last time was in 2006, a friendly appearance before a Senate committee by Stephen Harper. But Trudeau is under pressure as other key figures in the affair come forward. Mark and Craig Kielberger, founders of the reorganization, testify tomorrow. Also appearing tomorrow, former chair of WE's Canadian Board of Directors, Michelle Douglas, who resigned in March over what she called concerning developments at the charity. Tomorrow she's expected to explain that. The Trudeau government's handling of the pandemic gave it a large bump in the polls. There was a general warming towards the Prime Minister, and then boom, four months in, here is uh, another uh, ethics scandal, another ethics issue that's popped up that really says to Canadians, right, that's the thing that annoys us about him. In a poll released today by the Angus Reid Institute, 53% said their view of the Prime Minister had soured in the last month. But Chachi Curl says there are signs the government doesn't want to repeat the mistakes of the SNC-Lavalin affair. There was a steady drip, drip, drip of new information on an almost daily basis and an almost stubborn refusal on part of the Prime Minister to, if not acknowledge wrongdoing and apologize, then at least acknowledge that he could have done better. This time, the apologies came fast. I made a mistake in not recusing myself immediately from the discussions, given uh, our family's history. And I'm sincerely sorry about not having done that. Again, I want to apologize for any mistakes I've made in this situation. I'm sorry that they've occurred. Any committee appearance is a gamble. The opposition has a chance to inflict some real damage this week, while the Prime Minister will be hoping he can start to turn the page. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatineau, Quebec. After reports about bullying and harassment at Rideau Hall, today Governor General Julie Payette hired a new Chief of Staff and Special Advisor. Bridget Carboneau is a former manager at Cirque du Soleil. This follows a CBC News report last week where more than a dozen sources allege Payette and her official secretary created a toxic work environment. The Privy Council office is also conducting a review. Public opening glory! In Nova Scotia, a crowd gathered outside the Justice Minister's office to call for a public inquiry into April's mass shooting. Last week, the government announced an independent review into the massacre, but some families say that's not enough. 22 people were killed in April, the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. Tonight, newly unsealed court documents say several people told police the shooter had hidden compartments and false walls on his properties. One person who knew the gunman described him as a sexual predator who smuggled drugs. These details have not been proven in court. McGill University is dealing with the racist history of its original benefactor. James McGill made his fortune on the backs of slaves, but rather than removing his statue or changing its name, some at the university are pushing for a different path forward. Jayla Bernstein explains. Sadly, the campus today, in many ways, is what James McGill would have wanted it to look like in terms of the whiteness of the campus. Professor Charmaine Nelson says it's time her university stops glossing over the story of James McGill. She says the school doesn't have to change its name, but it does have to acknowledge the truth behind it. 
What we are requesting, myself and the students, is that we think critically about how he made his money and explicitly on whose backs his money was made. And I mean that directly because, again, we know he enslaved at least five people of Indigenous and African descent in Canada, in Montreal, and again was also active in exploiting enslaved people in the Caribbean. Nelson and her students are calling for action, including offering more scholarships for black and indigenous students and an office for students of African descent. Student Jane O'Brien Davis says it would make her feel more included on campus. Feelings of maybe not unwelcoming, but just not part of a community, um, un underrepresented, um, as though your experiences aren't the McGill experience. Some have petitioned for this statue of James McGill to be torn down. Instead, this group is asking for a new monument, one to acknowledge his ties to slavery. McGill did not commit to that, saying, like many men of his era and his socioeconomic class, James McGill had connections to slavery and colonialism. This is not a connection that our university is proud of, but it neither should nor can be ignored. The university says it's recruiting two postdoctoral fellows to research and help inform how it will address that history and the harm that it caused. Nelson says that process is too slow, as the school is about to mark its 200th anniversary. Now is the time for change. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Today, a man who worked to improve the lives of American blacks was given a high honor. The body of Congressman John Lewis was brought into the U.S. Capitol to lay in state. A motorcade made its way through the sweltering streets of Washington. Hundreds waited along the route. It means a lot, because now we know who helped us walk the street. Then a ceremony under the Capitol dome. John was revered and beloved on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the Capitol. Late this afternoon, former Vice President Joe Biden paid his respects, but when the president was asked... No, I won't be going, no. A private funeral will be held for John Lewis on Thursday. Next, a question a lot of parents are grappling with. Should kids go back to school in September? Not comfortable at all. Next, we look at what the science says about kids and COVID-19, the risks of going to class and the risks of staying home. You're making me wear a mask, if otherwise yeah. you're not you're going to deny me service. Canadian anti-maskers borrow from the anti-vaxxer playbook to spread misinformation. And artists surprise Newfoundland's frontline heroes. It was my first time painting someone that I've never met before. We're back in two minutes. In Quebec, the city of Sherbrooke has closed all of its public outdoor pools after a lifeguard tested positive for COVID-19. Other lifeguards are now being tested. And meanwhile, a hockey camp in Montreal has shut down after a coach tested positive for the virus. The new school year is just weeks away. Millions of Canadian students still don't know what that will look like. And parents are trying to weigh the risks of going back versus staying home. Christine Birag brings us the latest science on COVID-19 and kids. The sneaky monster crept. crept. Having her children home for months hasn't been easy, but Narissa Critchlow isn't eager to send them back to school either. Not comfortable at all, <laughs> to be frank. Um, I just feel that we are not close enough to quite understanding um, the virus itself. Most studies examining kids in COVID-19 are trying to answer two questions. What is the likelihood of children getting the infection and what is the likelihood of them spreading the infection? A recent analysis looked at 550 COVID-19 cases among children under 18 in China, Italy and Spain. It found just nine children had a severe infection. One who had underlying conditions died. When it comes to infecting caregivers, a large study from South Korea found children under 10 transmitted the virus less often to adults at home, while those between the ages of 10 and 19 spread the virus as well as adults do. Researchers speculate young children may not sneeze or cough as hard and they're shorter and their infected droplets may not travel as far. Still, when schools do reopen, there will be new clusters of cases. But doctors say a lot will depend on the infection control measures that are put in place by schools 
and what's happening just outside of them. We've seen in other jurisdictions that the safest uh, way to open schools is where the community transmission rates are low. So many times I hear, well, you can't be too careful. Some doctors argue children may not be falling ill, but they're suffering in other ways. Existing evidence shows chronic absenteeism, even in kindergarten, has consequences. There's long-term impact on their cognitive development, on their social development, on their overall ability to function in society. For me, it's really important um, that the schools have some sort of testing involved. New saliva tests for the virus could make that happen, but not by September. Experts say schools and communities must act now on what's been learned or risk harming a future generation. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead on the national, Canadian anti-maskers get some help from anti-vaxxers. A familiar playbook and the borrowed tactics used to spread misinformation. But first, the doctors are in to answer your COVID-19 questions, including this one. If two people are both wearing a mask and sunglasses, would it be safe to share a quick hug with faces turned away? The answer, next. All right, welcome back. Time now for your COVID-19 questions. With me tonight, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, and respirologist, Dr. Samir Gupta. Hello to you both. Let's get right to it, because we always have tons of questions. First one, some suggest airlines are not high risk because of air circulation and filter systems. I might be flying soon. I'm wondering whether I can take steps to decrease the risk of contracting COVID-19. Dr. Gupta, let's start with you. Yeah, so it's, it's a good point. You know, people think of airlines are sort of static tubes of air, but, but they're not. In fact, they have very high air exchanges. And the reason for that is, that, you know, if you're sitting next to a baby that soiled their diaper or next to somebody who's had air sickness, you can't sit around with those odors for eight hours. So they have high air exchanges. Uh, they've put in HEPA filters. They've been very good filtration systems in addition to that. And they're also now disinfecting between flights. So those are all good things. Uh, what they've taken away from us, though, is our sort of our best weapon against spread of this virus, which is that physical distance. Uh, so obviously, people need to be masked for the whole flight. Uh, they need to disinfect every surface they're going to touch, especially the tray table, uh, before you touch it, but then also after you touch it. Uh, and think about those times and those areas where there isn't that much air exchange, so like the airport lounge. And probably the highest risk is, in fact, getting on and off the plane. And that's where you should think about that physical distancing. Still so important to be alert. Uh, Dr. Saxner, this one is for you. Does your blood type put you at greater risk and severity level of COVID-19? We hear this question a lot. Yeah, there was some data early on in the pandemic that suggested that people with um, AB, AB um, blood types and possibly RH positive, so they can be positive or negative with those letters, um, might have a little bit of increased risk of severe disease. Um, that's always a bit complicated because we're not actually testing absolutely everyone and so we are testing the fraction that comes forward for testing. At the end of the day, the current data really looks like um, there might be an increased risk of acquiring disease or at least acquiring detected disease um, with type AB um, and maybe B and there might be some slight uh, reduced risk of having documented infection if you're type O. Um, however, the difference is actually quite small percentage-wise, and so I don't think anyone should feel that their blood type really significantly impacts their likelihood of getting infection, um, more so than the things they're choosing to do. And the other part is it doesn't seem like people are more likely to get severe disease um, with the, quote, higher risk blood types. And so I think it's a, a curiosity at this point. I don't think it should really change anyone's planning at all. Okay, fair enough. Dr. Gupta, are face shields as protective as face masks? Uh, that's a good one. So I like to think of them as complementary. So as healthcare workers, we actually do use both. Uh, but to be, to be fair, I've had patients who, who struggle with face masks, you know, for various reasons, claustrophobia or skin irritation. And they've asked me if face shields are a good alternative. Uh, we don't have a lot of data in this area, but just conceptually, you know, a face mask is directly up against your nose and mouth. So it's obviously going to filter many more of those droplets that are coming out. Um, and it acts as a filter for most of the droplets that will be coming in as well. Whereas the shield is at a certain distance. So there's obviously a chance for those droplets to disperse as they come out. And the air that you're entraining around that shield 
will also contain other people's straw poll. So it doesn't give that same protection. What it does do, though, is it protects your eyes. Uh, so that's why I consider it to be complementary, because that's something that masks don't do. Uh, so, you know, what I'm telling patients is ideally we really want you to wear these masks. If people absolutely can't wear the mask, then a face shield is certainly better than nothing. So last one to you, Dr. Saxinger. This is, uh, we don't have too much time here. If two people are both wearing a mask and sunglasses, would it be safe to share a quick hug with faces turned away? And this last line is poignant. The need for human touch can be strong. So I think that when we talk about getting... Um, closer. Uh, we have to look at this as being kind of more of a special occasion um, because routine closeness can lead to increased transmission. If you were to give someone a special occasion hug, wearing a mask, glasses, hand hygiene and brief contact with faces turned away would be the safest way to do it. So it's, it's a difficult one to call. Yeah, we're still not there yet. Doctors, thank you both once again. So as you know, we are asking your questions about COVID-19 as often as possible. Please send us the questions you have. Message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Nearly 9,000 Canadians with COVID-19 have now died, but that number doesn't really show the extent of what and who we've lost. So CBC News started the project called Lives Remembered. Tonight, Cornelius Van den Hennenberg is remembered by his daughter. My name is Patricia Munyante. I'm the youngest of six children. And our dad, Cornelius Vanden Hennenberg, passed from COVID-19 on April 23rd, 2020. He was 97 years old. He grew up in the Netherlands where he met and married our mom, Anna. And following the war, he convinced mom to move to Canada. Dad was known as Casey in Ottawa and he loved chatting with everyone and anyone that would listen. He was a foreman in construction, and once he retired, he returned to his great love, farming, breeding miniature donkeys, growing organic vegetables to sell by the side of the road. His favorite pastime was to walk for hours in the fields or along the dirt roads in the country. All of his hard work was with the goal to provide a better life for all of us for his family. Our childhood was filled with fun adventures and lots of opportunities from playing hockey to him teaching us track and field in our backyard. I feel like we all inherited some of dad's qualities, honest, hardworking, and to value and care for the things we have and the people we love. If I could say something to my dad, it would be this. Dad, none of us were surprised by the fight you put up with this virus. We wish we could have been by your side to give you strength. And we're sorry you were by yourself. But we're happy and at peace that you're back with your true love, Mom. Totsins, Pops. We've gathered more of the stories of those lost to COVID-19 online as part of the Lives Remembered project. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. Next on The National, a look at a country pushed to the brink by COVID-19. They are begging for the pot of milk or for the bag of rice. Lebanon was already facing an economic crisis. Now the pandemic is locking down hope and fueling fear. Floods triggered by days of heavy rains inundated this hospital in India's most populous state. Roads in the area were washed away. Thousands were displaced. Millions have been affected by monsoon floods in South Asia this year. And some 80,000 people, mostly domestic tourists, are being rushed out of a resort city in Vietnam. That's after three residents tested positive for coronavirus. This is the first case of community transmission in the country since April. Officials say the process of getting people out will take at least four days. Meanwhile, physical distancing measures in the region have been reintroduced. Lebanon is often thought of as a microcosm of the Middle East. It's diverse, vibrant and precarious. As COVID-19 spreads, it's now facing a fresh lockdown and orders that will stretch well into next month. Margaret Evans shows us a country now dancing between desperation and disaster. 
Lebanon is hurting, and this time, say many Lebanese, no strangers to fortunes reversed, it's different. You need only catch a glimpse of a haunted face at a charity like this one in Beirut to see what they mean. Fadia Marji says all four members of her household have recently lost their jobs. There is nothing in this country, she says. No water, electricity or food. And with such crazy prices, living here is bad. Lebanon is in the midst of an economic crisis that is redrawing the middle class, sending many tumbling towards poverty. For those already there, it's even worse. Elias Halil is with Beit al Baraka, which, among other things, runs a free supermarket for those in need, using a voucher system to ease the shame that can come with the asking. You can see moms, dads who are educated, who used to have jobs, who never begged for anything. They are begging for the pot of milk or for the bag of rice, which is honestly devastating. The carrots being handed out come courtesy of the Lebanese Food Bank. The executive director says charities themselves are struggling to stay afloat. The economic situation, the coronavirus, everything is mixed up. So the people who are not, who are not able to think uh, about the future. But the seeds of Lebanon's current crisis were planted well before the pandemic. Sectarian political elites accused of lining their own pockets and trying to run the country on what critics describe as a foreign investment Ponzi scheme. It's the bankers, the central bank, and the politicians who, to my mind, were all in bed together. They played a very high risk stakes game with the money of ordinary Lebanese. Last fall, revolution was in the air. Thousands of people jamming the streets across the country and across sectarian lines to demand change. But since then, the Lebanese lira has lost 80% of its value, a disaster in a country that relies heavily on imports. And many of the shops and restaurants that closed during the coronavirus lockdown are slumbering still calls for help from abroad have so far gone unanswered. The International Monetary Fund linking any cash injection to a firm end to corruption. Unfortunately, the current political process is still showing every resistance to carrying out the reforms needed. And quite frankly, they continue operating as if it's a business as usual. And it's hardly that. The lights are literally going out in Lebanon. Power cuts in some cases lasting up to 20 hours at a time. Private hospitals, by far the majority in Lebanon, are threatening to shut their doors, struggling to buy medicine and fuel to keep generators going. We don't have enough money in our hands uh, to run the day-to-day -day operations. The hospitals are reaching a point where they will not be able to admit patients, only critical patients. Not surprisingly, those who can are trying to leave. In an apartment perched over the famed Beirut skyline, Micheline Aoun and her husband Bruno Melki know they occupy a place of privilege, still more than managing. But they're hoping for visas to Canada soon. I don't see any hopes in the near term. Honestly, otherwise I would have stayed. Melki, a dentist, calls Lebanon a failed state. Since I was a child, I always uh, listened to my grandfather say, tomorrow it will be better. My father used to say, you will see, tomorrow it's going to be better. It's a promise they'd like to make to their own children and keep. To them, that means leaving Lebanon. It implies a terrible loss of faith and those left behind fear a brain drain that will set the country back even further. Wissam Harb used to play at bars and restaurants. Now he tries to earn what he can busking. There is nothing, he says, not even a little bit of hope. Everyone is thinking of emigrating. Lebanon is finished. The country has stood on this precipice before, the difference being that no one's betting on Lebanon anymore, not even its own people. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London.
Next on The National, a closer look at Canadian anti-maskers. They are pushing back against mandatory masks and the tactics they're using are from a familiar playbook. Welcome back. More and more provinces and cities are adding a new tool to their fight against the spread of the coronavirus, mandatory mask policies, especially in places where it's hard to physically distance. Starting today, after a two-week grace period, people refusing to wear a mask can be banned from boarding public transit in Quebec. In Nova Scotia, masks will become mandatory in most indoor public spaces on Friday. Calgary will follow suit on Saturday. There are, of course, medical exceptions to those rules, and on the whole, most people seem to be complying. But, as Nicole Ireland tells us, some groups oppose the idea, and they are getting help from anti-vaxxers to spread misinformation. How many of the rights have to be suppressed? When mandatory masking came to Toronto, so too did examples of pushback, like this one at a Toronto emergency department. Well, you're making me wear a mask, if, otherwise yeah. you're, not, you're gonna deny me service. Organized anti-mask groups have sprung up to protest not only masking, but physical distancing, contact tracing, and most other public health measures to fight COVID-19. We've witnessed the stripping of our basic human rights and freedoms at breathtaking speeds under the false pretense of a global pandemic. Conspiracy theories and downplaying health risks are tactics often used by the anti-vaccination movement. Now, CBC News has confirmed that at least one anti-masking group in Toronto has partnered with the Canadian Anti-Vax Organization and is taking leadership seminars from a prominent anti-vaccine advocate in the U.S. There's a lot of uh, similarities between the anti-masking sentiments and movement with anti-vaccine. Maya also, Goldenberg studies vaccine hesitancy. She says organized anti-vaccination groups and anti-masking groups grow out of a mistrust of government and health authorities. When you don't trust the sort of basic infrastructure that are supposed to support public well-being, you're going to come up with all kinds of tactics to try to resist it. Those tactics include spreading false claims that wearing a mask can cause people to suffer oxygen deficiency, breathe in toxins, or even develop a compromised immune system. I have to say it disturbs me when I see people acting on information that I'm quite sure is not only incorrect, but potentially misleading and potentially leading to harmful outcomes particularly when it comes to some of the vulnerable patients. Doctors emphasize that there are some legitimate medical conditions that prevent people from wearing masks. They also understand that the guidance has changed, and that's been confusing. They say that's because they've learned more about how this new virus is spread and how wearing a mask can help keep people safe inside stores like this. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, frontline workers get some special recognition. Personal portraits by artists they've never met. The reaction when they see the results, that's our moment, next. Artists in Newfoundland are honoring frontline workers in the best way they know how, by painting portraits of them. So the trick here, the artists have never met their subjects until the portraits were unveiled, and that is our moment. I am an avid follower of art on Instagram and I started to see this one hashtag popping up and it was actually started by a portrait artist located in the UK named the artist would uh, connect with a worker, do a portrait and then actually give that portrait to the worker themselves. And it sort of seemed like the kind of thing that Newfoundland was made for and we decided we wanted to just kind of give it a try here. And we actually were going with, with the idea of frontline workers. I'm going to give Nathan the portrait that I've been working on of him. It was my first time painting someone that I've never met before. Wow. I love it. I actually <laughs> love it. Thank you for doing what that. you were doing. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. It's showing these people at a time when they really stood up and stepped up and did something for the people around them too. Okay, so as you heard there, this started in the UK. It was only for healthcare workers, but the folks in Newfoundland decided they needed to expand that. Nathan is, uh, works at a food mart. He says he was thrilled to get the portrait and the respect, and he certainly deserves both. That is a national for July 27th.